What we want to do now is consider the mechanisms of venous return. Now it's obvious that when the heart is pumping, it's going to generate a blood pressure, 120 millimetres over 80 perhaps, 120 millimetres when the ventricle is contracting. And that's going to send the blood to your fingers, your toes, your head and everywhere. But of course you don't have little hearts in your feet to pump the blood back. So how is the blood getting back from the periphery to the centre of the body to get back to the atrium to be recirculated around again? And there's several components to answer this question. But first of all, let's think about the veins. So here we have a vein in the leg, perhaps. And we know that there are valves in this vein. And these valves are pointing up the way like this. And this is, of course, vital because the blood can go from below here. The blood can go from below there up to there. And from below there up to there, it can go up the way. But then if the blood tries to go back the way, these valves will shut. So they can open that way and they will shut that way. And that ensures one way flow of blood from the periphery down here to the centre of the body. So that's good. Now what people don't always appreciate is that there are actually two systems of veins in the legs and indeed two systems of veins in the arms. This one I've drawn here is near the surface of the skin there and these are the ones that you can see through the surface of the skin because they protrude and of course these are very useful in the arms for taking blood samples. So they're the superficial veins. But there are other veins that go in the way like this. So that vein will carry on. But there's a vein that goes in the way like this. And again this has got valves. And we notice the valve is that way round, meaning the blood can go from the superficial vein through this vein here. But where does it go? Well, this blood goes into the deep veins, into the deep venous system. So here we have deep veins. And the thing about deep veins is they are inside the muscles. So here, surrounding this deep vein, we have the skeletal muscles. So this vein is inside a skeletal muscle. And as you probably know, the skeletal muscles are surrounded by a tough muscle fascia. Tough fibrous tissue on the outside of the muscle group. So we have the superficial veins, the deep veins, and these veins perforate the muscle fascia. They go through the muscle fascia to get inside the muscle. So they're often called perforator veins, short perforator veins. And they're taking blood from the superficial to the deep venous system. And that goes on off up. And in the case of the legs, that's going up towards the inferior vena cava. And there are also valves in these deeper veins as well. And again, these valves are pointing up the way, so the blood can go up but can't go back. We don't want the regurgitation. Now, these superficial veins, the blood is at relatively low pressure. But there are movements of the muscle against the skin, generating some pressures in these veins. And that will cause the wall of the vein to be pressed on like that. And when you press on the wall of the vein, that's going to increase the pressure inside the vein. So external pressure will increase intravenous pressure. If that happens, 
the blood will try and go back down, but it can't because that valve will shut, preventing the regurgitation of the blood. But that one will open, as indeed will that one in the perforator vein, sometimes actually called communicator veins as well. So what this means is the direction of travel is from the superficial veins through to the deep veins. And if blood tries to go from the deep veins back to the superficial veins, it can't, it's prevented from doing so by the presence of the valves in the perforating communicator veins. And then when this muscle contracts, for example, if you're walking, if this is going through the calf muscles and the calf muscle contracts, that's going to squeeze on this vein. Let me show you how it's going to squeeze. It's going to squeeze like that really hard. It's going to slam that valve, slam that vein pretty well shut because the muscle contraction is vigorous, using a lot of energy. So all of a sudden, when the muscle contracts, that will greatly increase the pressure inside that compartment of the deep vein. And when the pressure increases in the deep vein, that will immediately close the valve below. That will shut, preventing regurgitation of the blood back to the periphery. But that valve will be opened. And as a result of that, because it's a high pressure muscle contraction, squeezing the wall of the vein, the blood will absolutely scoot back up towards the inferior vena cava. And this is such an effective mechanism, it's called the calf muscle pump. And it's vital to know about in any form of healthcare. Because if patients lie around with immobile leg muscles, then the circulation of blood through the deep veins is going to become sluggish. If the circulation of the blood through the deep veins is sluggish, then that increases the risk of thrombus formation. And that, of course, is deep venous thrombosis. It's a venothromboembolism. The clot from the deep vein will pass straight back up into the inferior vena cava. From the inferior vena cava, the blood will pass straight into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, through the pulmonary valve, into the pulmonary arterial system. What happens next depends on how big the clot is. If it's a big clot, it can block off a very early stage in the pulmonary artery. If it's a smaller clot, it will lodge further into the pulmonary arterial system. Either way, it's called a pulmonary embolism and it will infarct part of the lung tissue. And of course, it's a life-threatening condition because it's going to stop the flow of the blood going through the lungs. If the blood can't flow through the lungs, it won't get back to the left side of the heart. If the blood's not getting back to the left atrium, how can the left ventricle pump it out? Well, it can't. And when we get a sudden cessation of the circulatory system in the condition of obstructive shock. So very important that we tell our patients to keep their ankles moving. So all the time, keep reminding them, waggle your ankles when you're in bed, don't cross your legs, keep your legs moving, and of course mobilise patients as early as possible. Because we do lose thousands of patients a year through deep venous thrombosis. <clears throat> so, the blood absolutely scoots back up, it's called the calf muscle pump. Absolutely brilliant mechanism. As long as, of course, you're able to move the muscle. Now, even if you can't move the muscle, if you can just twitch it a little bit, that's good because that will increase the pressure. And even the tone of the muscle will cause some degree of pressure. But better to move the muscle. This is why sometimes soldiers on parade, when they have to stand still for long periods of time without moving their legs, can faint because the blood will pool in the superficial veins. If the blood's pooling in the superficial veins, it's not getting back to the right side of the heart to be oxygenated. If the blood's not getting back to the right side of the heart, it's not getting back to the left atrium to be pumped out in the left ventricle. So we're going to get failure of the systemic circulation. 
So very important to keep these muscles moving, all of the muscles, the leg muscles, and indeed waggling the toes, moving the feet will have some effect because there's muscles in the feet and there's muscles in the thighs, so we need to try and keep all of the leg muscles moving. And if patients can't do this for themselves, then we can do it for them. We can do passive exercises by moving their feet, by waggling their ankles for them, which we might want to do in unconscious patients, unconscious patients, for example, to keep the circulation going. Now, sometimes it's fair to say that these valves fail. That would be a pathological situation, but if these valves fail, can you see that when that muscle contracts, blood could be ejected from the high pressure deep veins to the superficial veins where the pressure is supposed to be low. So you could get regurgitation of high pressure blood into the superficial veins. That's okay to begin with because that valve will stop it going any further. But if that valve is subject to high pressure for a long period of time, that valve will fail. And then that valve will fail. And the veins will become blown out and torturous. And of course, this is the condition of varicose veins, varicosity. So we need to keep moving around to try and prevent varicose veins. Although there is a significant um, genetic component in varicose veins as well. Now also, very often where there's deep veins, the arteries, the deep arteries, lie adjacent to the vein. So imagine you have a vein there, and you have an artery there. The arteries, of course, are pulsatile, because the pulse goes through them. So they'll be expanding and contracting. So that will somewhat impose onto the veins. So we're going to get some alterations in the blood pressure in the veins because of the pulsation of adjacent arteries. That will provide some venous return. But by far and away, the main mechanism is the contraction of the skeletal muscles. So in the previous clip, we considered the components of venous return contributing to venous return, which are contraction of skeletal muscles, movement of blood from the superficial to the deep venous systems, and the pulsatization of adjacent arteries. But how else does blood get back from the periphery back to the center of the body? Well, another mechanism is the respiratory pump. So when you breathe in, if you put your hands there like that, that's your diaphragm, isn't it? Right, so when you breathe in, your diaphragm is going to flatten. When I breathe out, it's going to go up. Breathe in, diaphragm flattens. Breathe out, diaphragm goes up. So when I breathe in, the diaphragm flattens. That's going to increase the pressure in the abdominal cavity. And of course, on the right side, running up the abdominal cavity, you have the inferior vena cava. So as I breathe in, the diaphragm goes down, compresses the abdominal contents, that's going to press on the inferior vena cava. And the valves, because of the increased pressure in the inferior vena cava, mean the blood will go from the abdominal through to the thoracic cavity. And at the same time as I breathe in, the diaphragm is going to go down, that's going to reduce the intrathoracic pressure. It's going to reduce the pressure in the thorax. And that's going to help to suck the blood from the abdominal vena cava through to the thoracic vena cava. So the pressure in the abdomen is pushing, the increased pressure in the abdomen is pushing, the reduced pressure in the thorax is sucking. So increased pressure in the abdomen, pushing, reduced pressure in the thorax, sucking. That's going to increase venous return. And then, of course, when I breathe out, the diaphragm is going to go down. That's going to reduce the pressure in the abdomen. And that's going to make it easier for the blood to come from the legs up into the large abdominal vena cava. And the vena cava is large. It can store blood. It has a lot of blood. It's called vena cava because it's cavernous. It's a large vessel. So the blood will come in to the inferior vena cava when the pressure is reduced. 
And at the same time, when I breathe out, the diaphragm is going to go up when I breathe out. That's going to reduce the pressure in the abdomen, but that's also going to increase the pressure in the thorax. And that's going to help to push the blood that's in the thoracic vena cava back into the right atrium. So if patients are in bed, we encourage deep breathing. If patients are immobile, we encourage deep breathing because the deep breathing will increase the pressure changes during ventilation, increasing the pressure changes in the abdomen and the thorax, thereby increasing venous return, thereby maintaining the circulation. So as well as patients moving their ankles and their legs and their arms, we want to encourage deep breathing exercises when patients are immobile. And there's one other mechanism I think I'll mention, and this is to do with the velocity of the blood. Now the blood goes from the arterial system into the capillaries, and of course in the body there's untold millions of capillaries. So if you take the total cross-sectional area of these millions or billions of capillaries, it's actually very wide. But then as the blood goes back into venules, the relative diameter or the total diameter is going to get smaller. And then as we go into the larger veins, the diameter is going to get smaller again. And then as we go into the inferior vena cava, although it's a large vessel, the diameter, the total diameter or the total cross section in the vena cava is going to be much less than in all of the other superficial or all the other peripheral veins. So it's going to be smaller again. So what we have is a situation where it's very wide in the capillaries, gets narrower in the venules. This is the total cross-sectional area of the venous system. Gets more narrow in the larger veins and narrower still in the inferior vena cava. And indeed the same effect would be true in the superior vena cava draining the top half of the body. And that increases the velocity. So the flow of blood is going to be relatively slow in the capillaries, faster in the venules, faster in the larger veins, and faster still in the inferior vena cava, thereby speeding the venous return in the inferior and superior vena cava. And of course, maintenance of venous return is absolutely vital because cardiac output is dependent on venous return. That's called the Frank Starling reflex, that cardiac output is going to be the same as venous return. So if venous return is reduced, cardiac output will be reduced. And of course, if cardiac output is reduced, blood pressure can be reduced because systemic blood pressure is determined by cardiac output multiplied by peripheral resistance. So these vacant mechanisms are vital to maintain venous return. Without venous return, I'm afraid you can't have cardiac output.